It was July, 1945. Harry S. Truman was bound for Europe at a meeting of the Grand Alliance, the coalition of the three leading allied powers of World War II. The American president was poised between two of history's greatest battles, the World War that was ending and the Cold War that would replace it. Monumental issues confronted Truman and his wartime partners. The control of defeated Germany, post-war boundaries, winning the war with Japan, securing a lasting peace for Europe. There's not one piece of territory or one thing of a monetary nature that we want out of this war. We want peace and prosperity for the world as a whole. Victory over Germany had restored peace to Europe, but it was already threatened by a growing rift between the partners themselves. At the Potsdam Conference, President Truman and British Prime Minister Winston Churchill were on one side of the divide, determined to secure political freedom and democratic governments throughout post-war Europe. Their partner, the dictator of the Soviet Union, Joseph Stalin, had other plans. He was determined to dominate all of Europe and impose communism on its nations. The Allies had won the war, but their alliance would not survive the peace. Historic differences would prove too great to overcome. The bitter rivalry had its roots in the years of the First World War, when the competing ideas of communism and liberal democracy first came into conflict. Beginning in 1914, World War I consumed Europe in killing and destruction. For the Western powers, the war was hell. For the Russian army, it was pure hell, 20 times over. Sent to fight without food, without ammunition, sometimes even without weapons, the demoralized soldiers were a human sacrifice to the war gods, offered up by a corrupt imperialist ruler, Russia's Tsar Nicholas II. At home, the Tsar urged his subjects to work harder, eat less, support the doomed war effort. By 1917, the Russian people were tired of the war, tired of starving, and tired of their czar. In February of that year, a public demonstration for a higher bread ration escalated into a popular rebellion. Tsar Nicholas was overthrown and imprisoned. A new government came to power. They promised democratic elections, new freedoms, equal rights for women. A revolution belongs to the people. I propose to defend it against any attack, whether from the left or from the right. Russia's flirt with democracy would be short-lived. In Switzerland, an exiled Russian named Vladimir Lenin was planning his own revolution, based on the writings of the German philosopher Karl Marx. Living in 19th century England, Marx witnessed firsthand the growing disparity between the rich and the poor. He predicted that the inequities of the capitalist system would inspire a spontaneous revolution of the modern working class, the proletariat. Capitalism would be replaced by a system of social and economic equality called communism. We declare openly that our ends can only be achieved by the forcible overthrow of all social conditions. Lenin interpreted Marx's beliefs with religious and violent fervor. He returned to Russia to lead a group called the Bolsheviks and condemn the new government. They imagine that serious political questions are decided by voting. As a matter of fact, they are decided by class war. In October 1917, Lenin launched his revolution and seized control of Russia. He and his band of comrades then set about establishing their workers' paradise, the modern Soviet socialist state. Bank accounts and personal property were confiscated. Private fields became collectivized farms. Stores and businesses were surrendered to the state. Lenin was intolerant of dissent 
and totally ruthless. Arrest without charge, imprisonment without trial, disappearance without explanation, all became routine. In the United States, President Woodrow Wilson followed events in Russia with growing unease. He had committed his nation to World War I in order that the world be made safe for democracy. In his 14 points address to Congress, he outlined how to achieve his lofty goals based on principles of national self-determination, free trade, and international cooperation. But the president's vision for the future did not include the Bolsheviks. Instead, when civil war broke out in Russia in 1919, Wilson sent troops to fight against Lenin's government. And in England, a young Winston Churchill urged swift action. Before the House of Commons, he declared, we must strangle the infant Bolshevism in the cradle. Such rhetoric convinced Lenin and his comrades, including Joseph Stalin, that the West would stop at nothing to destroy their communist dream. Nearly three decades later, the battling ideologies remained bitterly opposed, and Potsdam did nothing to bridge the divide. President Truman called on Stalin to withdraw his troops from Eastern and Central Europe and to hold the free elections he had promised. Stalin refused. The region was a buffer zone, he said, and essential to his nation's security. The president was unconvinced. In his diary, he condemned the Soviet dictator for running a police government plain and simple. A few top hands just take clubs, pistols, and concentration camps and rule the people on the lower level. But Truman had a trump card. His nation had developed an entirely new class of weapon. It was destined to win the war with Japan, but it would also provide leverage in dealing with people like Stalin. If it worked, Truman noted, I'll certainly have a hammer on those boys. On the first day of the Potsdam Conference, a blinding flash seared the New Mexico desert ushering in the atomic age. The Manhattan Project had produced the world's first nuclear explosion. For the father of the bomb, Dr. J. Robert Oppenheimer, the awesome sight summoned the words of the Hindu god Vishnu. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. The president gave his final go-ahead to drop the bomb on Japan. Release when ready, he wrote. When Stalin learned that the city of Hiroshima had been destroyed by the American bomb, it came as no surprise. His spies within the Manhattan Project had long ago revealed its existence. But Truman's willingness to use the weapon presented a stark new reality for the Soviet leader. In a war fought with atomic bombs, his mighty Red Army would be rendered impotent. The balance has been destroyed, he would later tell the scientists working on the Russian bomb. That cannot be. Potsdam was the first and final meeting between Stalin and Truman, and set the tone for the early Cold War. In the words of one British diplomat, it was a very bad-tempered conference. As President Truman sailed for home, he could scarcely have imagined the decades of Cold War that lay ahead. There would be no Pearl Harbor in this coming struggle, no sudden attacks or declarations of war, just a growing sense of fear and distrust pulling the former allies toward a confrontation that neither could afford, but that neither would manage to escape. 